it will reduce the possibility that the Chinese communists, misjudging our firm purpose and national unity, might be disposed to challenge the position of the United States and precipitate a major crisis which even they would neither anticipate nor desire. Once again, it seemed, the Chinese communists took heed of the warning. Despite a few threatening moves, the advertised invasion was not attempted. In January 1955, the so-called Formosa Resolution was passed by Congress with an overwhelming majority. Some of its provisions were to be reiterated by Dulles in the future. The joint resolution of Congress authorizes the President to employ the armed forces of the United States for the protection not only of Formosa, but for, I quote, the securing and protection of such related positions and territories of that area now in friendly hands, and the taking of such other measures as he judges to be required or appropriate in ensuring the defense of Formosa. The related positions were duly held to include the offshore islands of Quimoy and Matsu. When these in turn were threatened, opinion in America once more became divided. Was too much being guaranteed? Were such unimportant bases really worth defending at the risk of a Third World War? Senator Walter George was doubtful. I have very little understanding for any American who is afraid for representatives of his government to talk with anybody on the peace of the world. What do these timorous nitwits think we are? I do not see how we can escape from the conclusion that it is better to talk, to confer, than to go to war. Such moderation in any question involving a negotiation of any kind with communist China became increasingly rare in America during the 50s. All too often, the tone was rather along the following lines. Anybody or any nation that are sympathetic with the communist China today, and I take it from your debate here today, you and Senator Humphrey, that you are. That is because absolutely you, vilification. You, because you're not, you're not for going over there and fighting him. You're even keeping from keeping the nationalist government for fighting him, that you're not opposed to the communist government in China. And I, I say to you, you're not fundamentally opposed to us. All I can say is that the senator from Indiana Lincoln. is a senator prevaricator and, a deliberate, and deliberately indul indulging in falsehood and character assassination. This I is an outrage. I say to you, yeah. it's senator true Lehman. and I stand by. May I senator say Lehman. to you, Senator Capehart, that's a libelous statement. I've been no more fighting. libelous than what you said a moment ago about I me. Senator Capehart versus Senator Humphrey. On the vexed question of the recognition of communist China, Senator Nolan was no less emphatic. On the day that communist China is voted into membership in the United Nations, I shall resign my majority leadership in the Senate, so that without embarrassment to any of my colleagues or to the administration, I can devote my full efforts in the Senate and throughout the country to terminate United States membership in that organization and our financial support of it. Senator Nolan was not called upon to resign. It could be claimed for brinkmanship that it had never led to war, but whether Dulles was justified in his opinion that on three occasions it had actually averted war must remain a matter of opinion. The policy was not without its hazards, and for that reason was attacked as vigorously in America by the Democrats as it was in other parts of the world. In Adlai Stevenson, it found a particularly ironic opponent but brinkmanship undoubtedly had the full support of President Eisenhower. It had certainly been safe enough to apply it against China, since China had no massive retaliation at her own disposal. The same could not be said about the Soviet Union. Molotov had already boasted that the Russian H-bomb could destroy American civilization, and there was not much comfort to be derived from President Eisenhower's comment. When you begin to talk in terms of, would this destroy civilization or would it not? I should say, uh, we're talking in comparative terms. What is the destruction of civilization? Uh, and in addition, how many of these things do you use? How uh, near do you approach saturation in any place? I would say this, that the thing is so serious that intelligent people ought to forego 
a great many lesser ambitions in the effort to achieve an understanding where the whole world could be assured that that understanding was going to be obeyed by all parties concerned. An attempt to obtain that sort of agreement was again made at the summit conference in Geneva during 1955. It was not successful. No more acceptable than free inspection was President Eisenhower's suggestion of open skies aerial inspection. The Soviet Union remained suspicious. An uneasy balance of power was being maintained in Europe and the Far East. Trouble was shortly to erupt in the Middle East, the Suez Crisis. While there was much American sympathy for Israel's retaliatory action in the Sinai Peninsula, there was very little sympathy in Washington for the Anglo-French invasion. This was deplored as a dangerous example of over the brinkmanship, and the president quickly dissociated himself from any part in the adventure. The action taken can scarcely be reconciled with the principles and purposes of the United Nations, to which we have all subscribed. And beyond this, we are forced to doubt that resort to force and war will for long serve the permanent interests of the attacking nations. Like Budapest, the Suez Crisis passed. But the discrediting of British and French authority in the Middle East left a vacuum which was an open invitation to an extension of Soviet influence. All the signs suggested that this was about to follow. The Truman Doctrine had forestalled a communist takeover in Greece and Turkey. The Eisenhower Doctrine, propounded in January 1957, was designed to do as much for the Middle East. We have just seen the subjugation of Hungary by naked armed force. In the aftermath of this Hungarian tragedy, world respect for and belief in Soviet promises have sunk to a new low. International communism needs and it seeks a recognizable success. Thus, we have these simple and indisputable facts. The Middle East, which has always been coveted by Russia, would today be prized more than ever by international countries. The Soviet rulers continue to show that they do not scruple to use any means to gain their ends. The free nations of the Middle East need, and for the most part want, added strength to assure their continued independence. The President then went on to define the terms in which American involvement should be conceived. The action which I propose would have the following features. It would, first of all, authorize the United States to cooperate with and assist any nation or group of nations in the general area of the Middle East in the development of economic strength dedicated to the maintenance of national independence. It would, in the second place, authorize the executive to undertake in the same region programs of military assistance and cooperation with any nation or group of nations which desires such aid. It would, in the third place, authorize such assistance and cooperation to include the employment of the armed forces of the United States to secure and protect the territorial integrity and political independence of such nations, requesting such aid, against overt armed aggression from any nation controlled by international communism. Like previous essays in brinkmanship against China, the Eisenhower Doctrine was assailed in America by the Democrats as being needlessly provocative. This time, the challenge was clearly and unequivocally issued to the Soviet Union itself. It was roundly denounced by the Russians as a front for American imperialism. In the event the Eisenhower Doctrine was to be invoked only once, by the Lebanon and Jordan in 1958, following the Qasem coup in Iraq. But by this time, the frontiers of American security have been widened in a truly spectacular way. that plaintive bleeping, the Soviet Union had announced to the world the opening of the space age. Sputnik 1 was quickly followed by Sputnik 2, and the heartbeat of a dog was heard from outer space.
American reaction to the launching of the Russian satellites was immediate. Such an achievement was of more than merely scientific interest. The military implications of the space rocket were alarming. America's ability to deliver the massive retaliation of the bomb was still dependent on the ability of the American Air Force to penetrate communist air defenses, for as yet, America had not even tested her first intercontinental ballistic missile. This she did some two months later, and this sound also was heard round the world. Take up, Liam. Count. Ten, nine, eight, eight. Ignition. Main stage. Four, three, two, one, zero. Plus one, two, three. A new significance had been added to the spiritual then being sung in the Negro struggle for civil rights. To the hand of God had been added the sudden fear of the hand on the button of the launching pad. Not even the scientists were reassured, for along with the testing of the rockets went continual testing of the bomb. The fission products, cesium-137 and strontium-90, that are produced in the testing of nuclear bombs, liberate high-energy rays, radioactive rays, which pass through the reproductive organs of human beings and damage the genes in such a way as to increase the number of defective children, and also pass through other cells of the body and damage them in such a way as to cause uh, cancer and other diseases to occur with increased incidence and to cause people to die earlier than they would if they had not been damaged in this way. My estimate is that uh, the carbon-14 will, over a period of many generations, in case that human beings continue to live on Earth, uh, damage the pool of human germplasm in such a way as to cause 1,250,000 children to be born with gross physical or mental defect. These are uh, as a result of the bomb tests carried out so far. So said Professor Linus Pauling, who presented to the United Nations in January 1958 a petition against continual nuclear testing that had been signed by over 11,000 scientists. This petition stated that uh, we, scientists representing 49 nations, urge that an international agreement to stop the testing of nuclear weapons be made now. We said that uh, even the tests of nuclear weapons are damaging human beings all over the world, and there's no doubt about this at all. As a result of this petition, a moratorium on testing was agreed upon at Geneva the following November. It was to last for less than three years. In September 1961, atmospheric nuclear tests were resumed by the Soviet Union. In the field of space research, the Russians were advancing their early lead, and a Russian missile was the first to reach the moon in 1959. The next lunic transmitted the first moon pictures back to Earth. Today, a new and wonderful announcement was made. The launching of the third Soviet space rocket will, without doubt, enrich science with new and unique information about the universe, thus preparing man's flight to the stars. The Soviet people are at a rapid pace reaching interplanetary space. Commented General Medeiros. The question is, can we catch up? The only way, obviously, that we can catch up is to go faster than they go from here on, and I don't know how fast that is. So maybe we just better run like hell. The answer to that came from the Defense Department's own Director of Research. 
There's no way to hurry up. Uh, there's no way to overcome the basic advantage they have uh, of having a rocket, uh, their big rocket, be twice as big as ours in less than several years. And a final note of warning was sounded by Dr. Werner von Braun. The momentum they have built up in their program, the mass of experimental data they have acquired, will make possible other startling feats in the not too distant future. We have been told that the hammer and sickle flag has now been planted on the moon, and we have no reason to doubt it. I would not be at all surprised to be hearing a human voice from outer space that will have an unmistakable Russian accent. Von Braun's reference to the hammer and sickle had not been merely fanciful. The first reference had been made to it, jubilantly enough, by Mr. Khrushchev when he landed in America in 1959. He'd been invited to make the visit by President Eisenhower himself as a goodwill gesture towards the thawing out of a seemingly endless Cold War. Mr. Khrushchev was happy to accept the invitation. Shortly before our, uh, this meeting with you, Mr. President, uh, the Soviet uh, scientists, engineers, technicians and workers filled our hearts with joy by launching a rocket to the moon. We have no doubt that the excellent scientists, engineers, and workers of the United States of America who are engaged in the field of conquering the cosmos will also carry their pennant over to the moon. The Soviet pennant, as an old resident, will then welcome your pennant, and they will live there together in peace and friendship as we should live together on Earth in peace and friendship and as all people should live who inhabit our common Mother Earth, uh, who is so generous to us all with her gifts. In that slightly mocking vein began Mr. Khrushchev's tour of the United States. Whatever it proved about peaceful coexistence, the tour certainly contributed to the gaiety of nations. Not that uh, Mr. Khrushchev refused any occasion to involve himself in argument, or for that matter to register complaints, as in Los Angeles. When I came here to the city, I was given a plan, uh, a program of what I was to be shown and who, whom I was to meet here. А сейчас мне подошли и сказали, нет, вы говорите в такой-то городок поехать не можете. Как называется он? But uh, just now I was told that I couldn't go to Disneyland. Я говорю, почему? I asked, why not? Может быть, там теперь ракетные площадки созданы? По запуску ракет? Rocket launching pads there? Я не знаю, да. I don't know. Мне говорят, видите, ехать вам нельзя туда потому, что мы, вот послушайте, послушайте, что, говорит, мы, то есть американские власти не могут, если я туда поеду, гарантировать мою безопасность. And just listen, just listen to what I was told. We, which means the American authority, cannot guarantee your security if you go there. Что у вас там, холера, что ли, развелась, понимаете? Или что там, понимаете? Чума, что ли, что я могу заразиться? What is it? Is there an epidemic of cholera there or something? Я говорю, я очень хотел бы посмотреть. Я говорю, что я очень хотел бы поехать и посмотреть. And I say, I would very much like to go and see Disneyland. Disneyland notwithstanding, Mr. Khrushchev's reception in America appeared to bode reasonably well for the future. Impersonal issues, it seemed, could be reduced to far more personal and friendly terms. Next year, the President was to be the guest of the Soviet Union. The truculent ultimatum which they had recently issued over the future of Berlin, Mr. Khrushchev cheerfully withdrew as a personal gesture. Relations between the two leaders appeared to be positively cordial. So did Mr. Khrushchev's farewell message to the people of America. Permit me in conclusion to wish the American people prosperity and happiness and to express the hope that our visit to the United States and the forthcoming trip of President Eisenhower to the Soviet Union will be regarded not only by the American and Soviet people but everywhere in the world as the beginning of joint efforts in the quest for ways of bringing our nations closer together and strengthening uh, general peace. Goodbye, good luck, friends. 
Alas for that hope. A summit conference had been agreed between the Western powers for the summer of 1960, which the Soviet Union had agreed to attend. The future of Berlin was again to be discussed, as also the larger question of the long-delayed peace treaty with Germany. The conference was arranged for May in Paris. On the 5th of May, the Soviet government announced the shooting down of an American U-2 reconnaissance plane some 1,300 miles within Soviet territory. Mr. Khrushchev went to Paris, but not to attend a summit conference. In his opening statement, Mr. Khrushchev repeated his attack on the United States for carrying out the U-2 espionage flights, these aggressive flights as he called them, and he repeated his readiness to take part in summit talks only if President Eisenhower first made a public apology and agreed to punish those responsible. He went on, and these are the words of his English interpreter. We shall shoot these planes down. We shall strike devastating blows at the basis from which they take off and at those who establish these bases and actually run them. But President Eisenhower has not a single word of condemnation to say about the provocative policy towards the Soviet Union on which the espionage flights are based. President Eisenhower refused to apologize or to condemn anybody. He took full responsibility for the U-2 flights, about which the Russians had known for the last four years. Only last week in his Paris press conference, Chairman Khrushchev confirmed that he knew of these flights when he visited the United States last September. In torpedoing the conference, Mr. Khrushchev claimed that he acted as a result of his own high moral indignation over alleged American acts of aggression. As I said earlier, he had known of these flights for a long time. It is apparent that the Soviets had decided, even before the Soviet delegation left Moscow, that my trip to the Soviet Union should be canceled and that nothing constructive from their viewpoint would come out of the summit conference. The summit conference was called off. President Eisenhower did not visit the Russian Disneyland. Berlin and the rest remained a problem for the future. Despite the seriousness of the issues involved, with all its charges and countercharges, hypocrisy and self-righteousness, there was something essentially ludicrous about the whole of the U-2 incident. Perhaps the only redeeming feature of the story was the new spirit emerging in America, which promptly called attention to the fact. The State Department issues another statement, and, and then the president said, uh, well, what are they so self-righteous about, you know? They've got spies in our country, too, which is true. There are Russian spies here now, and I think if we're lucky, maybe they'll steal some of our secrets, and then they'll be two years behind, and that'll... <laughs> well, now, what's happening to the national morality? We've had two spies in our history. Nathan Hale, who said, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country, and Francis Powers is quoted as saying, this shatters all my plans. <laughs> it's depressing. So now, this, let's see, where does that take us? Oh, now we have surplus U-2s, because the president suspended the flights. So they were purchased by an entrepreneur, and you'll be hearing more about that later probably in one form or another. Maybe you'll be walking around Los Angeles and these leaflets will drop down from the sky and they'll say, your picture's just been taken and is available for 25 cents. <laughs> Mozart was not very far ahead of his audience. A new spirit was emerging in America. The age of conformity was over. The U-2 incident really supplied the epilogue to the Eisenhower era. Other stories were to make the headlines. Eisenhower warned away from Japan, civil war in the Congo, the first Polaris missile fired. But the coming presidential election made bigger headlines than any. Signs of the changing times had been noisily obvious when the House Committee on Un-American Activities tried to revive its hearings in San Francisco earlier the same year. On that occasion, a large body of students rose in open revolt against conformity. Even police and hosepipes could not revive the witch hunt. Rather brutally across the floor and were unable to keep their balance on the, in the flood of water 
and the marble floor in here and seem to be very hurt, but I see none of them now. Perhaps they've all, they're all better. They've all recuperated. Police now are clearing away through the center of the students. are hauling out a bearded student, a woman. A woman is protesting and they are dragging her out too. The police who left the upper floor here have suddenly reappeared on the lower floor and they seem prepared to, to start hauling the students down the stairs from behind. Either one by one or At there. the same hearings, the following statement was made by one of the witnesses who had been called upon to testify. My boy of 15 left this room a few minutes ago in sound health and not jailed solely because I asked him to be in here to learn something about the procedures of the United States government and one of its committees. Had he been outside where the son of a friend of mine had his head split by these goons operating under your orders, my boy today might have paid the penalty of permanent injury or a police record. For, the, for desiring to come here and hear how this committee operates. If you think that I am going to cooperate with this collection of Judases, of men who sit there in violation of the United States Constitution, if you think I will cooperate with you in any way, you are insane. The age of conformity was indeed over, and its end brought with it the end of the Eisenhower administration. Despite his personal plea that the Republican candidate Richard Nixon should be returned at the coming election, America thought otherwise. A new decade was an invitation to new ideas and a new outlook. John F. Kennedy was there to supply them. To all Americans, I say that uh, the next four years are going to be difficult and challenging years for us all. The election uh, may have been a close one. But I think that there is general agreement by all of our citizens that a supreme national effort will be needed in the years ahead to move this country safely through the 1960s. I ask your help in this effort, and I can assure you that uh, every degree of mind and spirit that I possess will be devoted to the long-range interests of the United States and to the cause of freedom around the world. So now uh, my wife and I prepare for a new administration and uh, for a new baby. Thank you. Four years were not to be granted to President Kennedy, merely a thousand days. And the shadow of the bomb hung over all of them. That was the second of three programmes compiled from recordings of the time and produced by D.G. Brideson for the BBC. The narrator was Edward Ward. The last programme in the series will deal with the Kennedy era and the beginning of the war in Vietnam. <laughs>